Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome to DevEx's coverage of the World Health Assembly for 2021. My name is Vince Chadwick. I'm the Brussels correspondent uh, for DevEx. And this is my favourite time of year because I get to catch up with our global health reporter, uh, Jenny Lee Ravelo, who many of you will know uh, as the author of our checkup newsletter. Um, Jenny keeps an eye on the World Health Organization um, all year round. And so she and I are going to be having a brief chat this morning to just introduce what we're, what we're doing um, over the week. Uh, we've got uh, three days of events planned for you today, tomorrow and Thursday. And then we've got a special pro event next Tuesday um, where we're really going to try and dig into the main debates around this year's uh, assembly. Uh, over those three days, we've got speakers from the World Health Organization and the Gates Foundation um, and others. All of the information is on our website, so I won't get into that now. Um, today, we've got a set of really great uh, discussions. Uh, we're covering uh, mRNA technology, whether it's a, a game changer for global health, uh, as many have discussed. We're looking at the role of, of data with our, um, our partners at Novartis. Um, and we're also looking at uh, the recommendations of the famous, I almost said infamous, uh, Jenny will tell us how infamous they are, the independent panel um, on what lessons we can learn from the COVID uh, crisis for global health. And um, Jenny, I guess a question for you, I am a re reporter who typically covers the EU institutions. And so I was um, kind of moonlighting as a global health reporter uh, last Friday. Um, we're following the Global Health Summit, which was, uh, you know, heads of state and others getting together to think about vaccine equity and things like that. And um, one of the things that struck me as Helen Clark and who we hear from shortly and others spoke was that there's actually been a lot of independent panels uh, or seemingly a lot of different recommendations coming out of this uh, crisis. And a question I was looking forward to posing to you is, how are we going to discern the difference between those recommendations that are really going to have an impact in the coming you know, weeks and months and those that are going to go in a cabinet somewhere in Geneva and never be heard from again? Well, hi, everyone. And thank you, Vince, for that great question. Well, I think that's what everyone's been asking, really, which of the many recommendations um, you know, coming out of this crisis that includes the, the recommendations of the independent panel is going to be taken forward by countries. So right now they're discussing at the World Health Assembly, right, a pandemic treaty. But um, for today, we actually have a, a, a a panel that's going to be doing a deep dive on uh, the recommendations of the independent panel for pandemic preparedness and response, um, you know, really focusing on how, you know, how can we take forward, how can we accelerate some of these recommendations, but we also will be starting uh, before that um, uh, a conversation with Helen Clark, of course, the coach, the co chair of the independent panel, um, you know, to talk about some of the recommendations. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. One of the things that Helen Clark um, said on, on Friday in her pre-prepared remarks was um, that there should be a one-term limit for the Director General of the World Health Organization um, uh, for seven years. Uh, and many people have said that this year, whatever Dr. Tedros does will be viewed through the prism of his potential re-election uh, efforts. Um, you have someone who follows global health quite closely. Um, what did you make of that recommendation? Is that is that new or is that something we've heard before? I think there's been some recommendations before like that, but what what the different experts have been saying was was that you know this is at least in their view this is going to at least take off some of the political you know um, pressure for the director general um, interference in terms of the work and make sure that the decisions of the, the who dg is going to be independent uh, of the countries but you know there's all I, it's a question of whether that's actually going to be taken out really um you know even if you um, extend the term of of the uh, director general it's it's a really interesting one, and um, I, I I wished I had a, a chance to to ask it, the question at the press conference on Friday about what um what the leaders would have made of that, but in the future. But for now, let's begin with your your conversation with uh, Helen Clark. Looking forward to it. Good day, everyone. I am Jenny Ravelo, senior reporter for DevEx, and I am here with us today, Miss Helen Clark former Prime Minister of New Zealand and the co-chair of the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness, 
prevention and response. Um, Helen, hi, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Well, today we'll be talking about really the recommendations of the independent panel. Um, everyone's been talking about it since it was published. And I would like to just touch on a little bit on some of the headline grabbing recommendations of the panel. Um, I guess this is a start. Um, Helen, um, can, you, can you tell us um, what gaps will be, you know, one of the recommendations was, the glo was having a global threats council. Can you tell us about this council? What gaps will this council fill in global health security? And how do you see it working with WHO? The idea is to lift the attention that pandemic preparedness and response gets up to the level of attention that we give uh, other very significant uh, global challenges. It's well known, for example, that the Security Council was uh, set up to uh, address uh, peace and security uh, threats. Uh, you have a lot of leader level uh, attention in, in summits like climate change or any range of things. But uh, global health preparedness and response for pandemics has tended to be dealt with uh, at a ministerial level, uh, at the World Health Assembly, and then in national governments, often at quite a low level. Very few countries, I think, their citizens could identify who the international health regulations focal point is for, uh, for, for their country. Now, look, we just haven't had enough high level attention to the issues until, of course, a pandemic strikes and we, we go into, into overdrive to, to try to deal with it and overcome the deficiencies of there not having been a coordinated, concerted effort to lift preparedness and response mechanisms everywhere. So there's, we're presenting a package of recommendations, but a, a very important part of that package is to construct what is really a high level oversight, monitoring and accountability uh, council at head of state level, and also including uh, representatives of civil society and private sector uh, to, to hold people accountable, hold countries accountable, uh, hold international organizations accountable for all doing their bit uh, to uh, see that preparedness is in place and response mechanisms are in place. We're all in this together. If any one country falters in trying to combat an outbreak or a pandemic, the rest of us, one way or another, will pay for it. Uh, we've got off, you know, in a way likely with diseases like Ebola, which, which didn't spread so much out of narrowly confined geographical areas. And maybe we've got complacent as a world. But what COVID shows us is that the system's broken. The status quo can't fix the problem. We have to lift this up to leader level, both at the national government level, and we make recommendations about that, but also at the global level. So that's the point of the council. Now, when people say to me, well, how about WHO? Isn't it doing its job? Absolutely not, because the council is not an operational body. As I said, oversight, monitoring, accountability. And I think it can be tremendously helpful to WHO. In our report, we say that WHO needs to now set very clear targets and benchmarks for countries to reach in order to uh, achieve a satisfactory level of preparedness and response. Uh, we say that a country plans uh, should now systematically be subject to a universal peer periodic review mechanism. The Global Council is there to help that and champion that and support WHO to exhort countries to get the results we need as a world. Remember, WHO has no power to enforce a country uh, to do any of these things. It can give guidelines, technical guidance, it can exhort, but the Council as a high level accountability body can really shine a spotlight on what's happening and what isn't. And I hope to get a healthy dynamic going among countries so that countries will want to compete to be seen to be uh, really uh, prepared. So, so that's the thinking behind the council, not to let these issues languish, if you like, at the level of Minister of Health and focal points and so on, but, but lift it up so it gets attention 
from the leadership level. My last point would be, I've been a, you know, a leader of my country for nine years. Uh, I know, you know what leadership's about. I've also been a health minister. With all humility, I can say that as health minister, I was far from being the most powerful minister in my government. <laughs> so uh, I know that to really get something moving at the national level, you need leaders focused on it. And to get it moving at the global level, you need to bring leaders in. It can't be dealt with satisfactorily at a ministerial level. That was interesting when you mentioned you know, bringing this to the highest level of government's attention. Um, how would you respond to concerns that this may weaken instead of you know, strengthening WHO? WHO's role is, is indispensable, but it needs help and it needs advocacy. In many ways, when you look at this pandemic, WHO was left to struggle pretty much on its own and it didn't have the tools that it needed. Uh, we have observed in our report that the international health regulations are very defensive and quite limited and often more of a hindrance than a help uh, to WHO in getting on and doing the job that needs to be done. You know, for example, WHO has no right under existing legal instruments to demand access to a country and get it uh, to go and inspect an outbreak. It has no right to publish information it has from a country without the country's uh, permission. It feels very constrained in using a precautionary approach uh, in, in alerting the world because the IHR require this cautious verification and so on. We're saying, for heaven's sake, this is the 21st century. This is not the Middle Ages when an infectious pathogen traveled on foot and by donkey to people. Uh, this is an era where we're highly globally interconnected. And if you see even a hint of a respiratory pathogen with pandemic potential on the loose, you need to start alerting pretty early. And we found the procedures just were not conducive to that. So everything we are saying is supportive of WHO being empowered to do its job and having high level advocacy for it, like the Global Health Threats Council, to support it to get countries to do what they need to do. You mentioned about you know WHO being constrained in applying the precautionary principle, and this is one of the things that people have been talking about with the panel's recommendation. I'd like to ask, um, what does applying the precautionary principle mean, and what are the challenges you foresee, um, you know, going forward? So, what you don't want is a situation where WHO is crying wolf every other day. Look, my understanding is that the, the WHO's you know, emergency program and surveillance and alert people, that they're scanning the world all the time. There's, there's lots of sources of information coming in uh, about, you know, here's a, evidence of a new disease somewhere. And, and to pick the one that's going to take off is obviously, uh, you know, qu quite a task. But what we say is that where it's a, a respiratory pathogen, this is in a category of its own and you can't wait for evidence of human to human transmission you should act as if it's highly likely and begin alerting the world to that we've also said that around the declaration of the public health emergency of international concern there need to be very clear objective and transparent and publicly available criteria to our panel it's a complete mystery why the emergency committee constituted under the international health regulations did not recommend calling this a public health emergency of international concern on the 22nd of January. Two days before, one of China's most senior scientists had pronounced that there was human to human transmission. And still, still, there was no declaration of a public health emergency of international concern. So I think it also needs to be made very clear that while of course it's useful to convene an emergency committee under the international health regulations, the director general in the end has the power to declare an emergency. And that was justified on the 26th, 22nd of, of January. In the event, it was eight days later. And you can see from the series of delays that, that built up from the time the cluster of cases of pneumonia of unknown origin uh, was identified, that there were days and weeks of delay, which delayed the public health 
emergency of international concern being declared. We are very concerned about that. Now, let me make one other point. We think that could be fixed by empowering uh, WHO, uh, by putting into a new pandemic um, framework convention, uh, more explicit uh, language about uh, the responsibilities of states and international organizations that fill in gaps in the framework. But here's the rub. When the public health emergency of international concern was declared, most countries didn't do very much. So much as we have identified that period in, in January as being one when things were slow to move and where the IHR were a hindrance, not a help, we then look at February and put our head in our hands because too few countries did much. It was almost as if they were watching what was happening in Wuhan as if it was on Mars and wouldn't happen to them, forgetting that we're so globally connected. If we'd used February better, we wouldn't have been in the mess we were in uh, by March. And so again, you know, reinforcing WHO so that the world knows when WHO declares a public health emergency of international concern, you better jump because if you don't, the COVID experience shows us what, what can happen. You have to be ready. You have to go on the front foot with a, actually aggressive measures put in place to avert this turning into a, a, a pandemic and the world was too slow. I think one follow up you mentioned about the pandemic convention. I remember, you know, the, the panel's call was really to have this in six months. Um, there now is some sort of debate happening whether to have it and how can it really change, you know, the situation next time we have a crisis. What's your what's your take on all of this, you know, different discussions? If not now, when? Clearly, uh, the international legal instruments we have and the regulations are insufficient. So a pandemic a convention which fills the gaps uh, and is very clear about the responsibilities of states and international organizations is needed. Now, as to the time frame, we have likened the COVID-19 catastrophe uh, to the Chernobyl moment in nuclear safety. And then we look at what happened with the Chernobyl moment of a major nuclear accident with spillover uh, impacts uh, across borders. Within five months of Chernobyl, there were two new treaties on nuclear safety <laughs> within five months. And our challenge to the World Health Assembly is move on. You have uh, Article 19 of WHO Constitution, which allows for these framework conventions to be negotiated. When I was a young health minister, I went uh, more than 30 years ago to WHO to advocate for the framework convention on tobacco, which took too long. This one needs to be done now. Seize the momentum. While the leaders of the world are focused on this, focused on what could we do to stop it next time, get these important building blocks in place. The, the, the Global Council, uh, the new convention, uh, the financing mechanisms, uh, a redesigned Act A type platform. There's so many things that can be done. And if we don't do it now, when on earth will we? We can't count on the next global pandemic taking 102 years to come around. Could be next month, could not be. But we're not ready. We weren't ready for this one. And we need to get the institutions and mechanisms in place to make us ready. There is huge interest right now with, with the you know convention or treaty as they're calling it. And I'm sure um, this will be taken up at the World Health Assembly next week. Well, I don't think we have much time, but thank you so much, um, Helen, for sharing your insights on the panel's recommendations. Thank you so much everyone for tuning in to our conversation with Helen Clark. Now we're going to be doing a deep dive on some of these recommendations by the independent panel. And we have our panelists today are coming from different perspectives and I'm really excited to hear what their take on, on some of these recommendations and how we can you know, take them forward. So I'm just gonna um, introduce them briefly to you. Um, we have with us um, Gabrielle Fitzgerald, um, co-founder of the Pandemic Action Network, 
we also have with us Chandrika Bahadur, Director of the SDG Academy. And we have with us Dr. Ambrose Talisuna, Regional Advisor on the IHR and Global Health Security at the WHO Africa Office. Panelists, thank you for joining us today and welcome. Um, so um, you've heard um, you know, Helen Clark talking about some of the recommendations. Now, I want to hear your take on this. Um, just very briefly, can you just tell me one or two things that really caught your attention among the recommendations of the independent panel? Um, maybe we can start with Gabrielle. Thanks, Jenny, and thanks for hosting this important discussion. So two things that I think uh, really stand out are the recommendation for a Global Health Threats Council. Uh, this would be the first head of state level uh, type panel to review these issues. And I think having something at that level is incredibly important. It also allows for looking at a whole of government response, not just a health response. As we've seen with COVID, that's absolutely necessary. And then secondly, um, the financing mechanism for pandemic preparedness is also critical. And I could go on, but I know you wanted a short answer. We can go uh, deeper later on that. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. Um, Chandrika? Thank you, Jenny. And at the uh, thank you for having me here. And at the um, onset, I do want to say that I think this is an excellent report, uh, both in terms of its breadth, but also in terms of the um, creativity of the recommendations and really going beyond what one would normally expect from um, from a panel of this kind to really thinking through some of the core issues. The two, is the two recommendations that I particularly wanted to make reference to, one was the call for um, <clears throat> an agile surveillance and a validation and an alert system. And I think this is absolutely critical in the context of a fast move, fast moving and a fast evolving pandemic and you know we can discuss later on why i think it's so important but i particularly in the way uh, the information has flowed and affected um, uh, low and middle income countries i think this is critical the second recommendation um, that also immediately struck a chord was the pre-negotiated platforms for um, tools and supplies for covid 19. again looking at this from the context of resource constrained settings um, this is absolutely a critical in terms of global management. So let me stop here and then we can come back to some of these issues. I think the World Health Assembly currently is also discussing some of those uh, you know, recommendations. I'll get back to you on that, Chandrika. And um, Ambrose? Thank you very much for, for inviting me to be to comment about uh, uh, these recommendations of the panel. I think that the panel recommendations are, are really very welcome. And specifically, I look at the one on invest in preparedness now to create a fully functional capacities at the national, regional, and global level. If you look at really just a background, I mean, the COVID-19 pandemic has unraveled the need for robust public health emergency preparedness and response capacities. And this is the only way we are going to save lives. So the, the panel is really spot on in, in making this recommendation. COVID has showed us that we have ac interrupted access capacity of the health system, the ability to, over, to, to deliver services. But COVID has also showed us that we are, it has interrupted the quality capacity. Our health workers are getting infected and all these are preparedness capacity and demand capacity has also been affected. So you look at people have lost incomes. And finally, what COVID has done is, is really it has affected the resilience capacity where we are able to deliver continuity of services even when we have a shock event. So for me, this, this, this first recommendation is really, really very, very, very critical and is welcome. The other that I really want to introduce briefly is that countries establish high level national coordination uh, for pandemic preparedness. And this is very key because let's first start off and say building capacity for pandemic preparedness is a primary responsibility of national government. So we need, we need high level political commitments. We need high level coordination mechanisms. But also COVID has showed us that we need multiple stakeholders, multiple disciplines. And the placement of the international health regulations focal point in the Ministry of Health it's kind of shoots us in the foot. And the recommendation here is really to have a, a high level coordination mechanism with gravitas to bring together different sectors, different actors, including the community. So I think that is also a very, very welcome recommendation. 
I wanted to touch on those, you know, that coordination mechanism, um, and as well as you know, Gabrielle talking about the global global threats council. You know, there have been talks about we already have a very convoluted global health architecture. Um, what um, I guess what gaps are this, you know, um, uh, structures going to fill? Or, or are they just going to add on to this already, you know, crowded um, uh, system? Um, Perhaps, Gabrielle? Yeah, I'll that. start. Um, so I feel very strongly that um, the, the answer is in your question, which this isn't just about global health. And so while there is a complex global health governance system, uh, we need to ensure this uh, moves outside the health sector. Uh, we've seen in so many countries, the devastation of the education sector of small businesses. And so this really uh, needs to be a higher level than just within the health sector. Do you have anything to that, um, Ambrose? Add to that? Yes, uh, yes, I think so. I, 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 I really think the, 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 the to elevate the leadership uh, to prepare and respond to public health emergencies at the global level is, is, is critical. We've seen in the COVID-19, I mean, member states, I think, have had an issue. That was the issue of compliance with sharing even information and, 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 and uh, compliance with uh, implementing the temporary recommendation. I think there should be some kind of peer-to-peer -peer mechanism and, and where we can really bring member states to account. And I think that's really, for me, the Global Health Security Council uh, has a role in trying to improve global governance. And also linked to what Gabriela was saying, I think, and what we'll be addressing later, and, and the, 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 this whole notion of in focusing on strengthening the capacity of WHO, we need to look at the, me the mechanism of how that is going to be done, and that's all at the global level. But I also have to add that outbreaks, much as we have the global mechanism, outbreaks cannot only be controlled at the global level. So we need governance structures at the country level. In fact, I was listening to a colleague from delegate of Nigeria this morning and was like, we need some national leadership. We need some national leadership. And if that is not there, then outbreaks are not detected and we detect them late. Uh, we detect them late. So we need the recommendations are good. We have to have a balance on how we are going to implement them uh, in terms of the, at the governance level, at the global and regional level, but also within countries. How can we take some of these things forward? Right now, a lot of countries, India, for instance, is battling a very you know deadly wave of COVID infections. Um, how do you think we can start working on on this recommend on some of these recommendations as well as some of the things that you mentioned, Chandrika? Uh, I think you know this is actually why the two recommendations I mentioned um, uh, jumped out at me because. Part of the challenge in India has been around um, information and, and, and understanding. So for example, just, just one example of this is understanding the emergence of new variants and how they actually affect the uh, trajectory and the speed of, the, of transmission. This is something that has to be done in real time. Um, it's something that takes resources. Um, and I think one of the challenges that uh, India faced was that uh, we we didn't have enough capacity to be able to uh, do sequencing of enough cases uh, in real time uh, when these variants were beginning to circulate. And so by the time we really got a handle on what was happening, it was already too late. Uh, and this is where uh, a global surveillance uh, and alert system can really come in handy. Now, there is, there's, a, there's a tension here, and I want to acknowledge that tension. It's something that I think um, Gabriel made reference to a little bit earlier, uh, which is this tension between an organization like the WHO uh, being the sort of gold standard of um, scientific advice and guidance um, to member nations on on the state of the pandemic and on the on the um, cutting edge science that we know uh, that we know about the pandemic versus the speed with which this information evolves. And the report talks about this very nicely, talking about the fact that the virus transmits faster uh, than, the, um, than the guidelines evolve. Uh, and I think this is going to be an ongoing challenge, particularly today where there is a democratization of scientific, not just scientific work on this, but where um, scientists have platforms that they probably didn't 
uh, let's say half a century ago. So what that means is, and what we've seen through the pandemic so far is that uh, the WHO, because it is uh, because of the precautionary principle, uh, has actually been uh, quite cautious about changing its recommendations. And, it, and, and it's struggled. You can see the struggle. And that struggle is an understandable one. Uh, but I do think that if we are to, you know, if we move forward in a post-COVID world, uh, what you, what, what, what an organization of this kind, the kind of role it should play, is really to be proactive and not reactive to science as it's emerging. And we've seen uh, the WHO play more of a reactive role so far. Whether you talk about airborne, whether you talk about, uh, you know, the advice on. Um, international travel or on mask wearing or even designation as a pandemic it's been it's been a little bit reactive and that's understandable given the structure of the organization uh, but i think this is a real tension and and th that's why um, having agility not just in information gathering but also being able to very quickly um, identify where there is evidence coming from to be able to evaluate that evidence and then to be able to put it forward is really important for credibility and for uh, having you know having that standard where countries will actually trust the information coming out of the organization so so that that's where i think uh, the tension lies and it's it's hard for an organization of this uh, uh, that's structured this way uh, to be cautious to uh, to actually move at that speed but i think that would be inevitable absolutely essential in terms of I want to throw uh, back the question to Ambrose because it was interesting that Chandrika mentioned about, you know, the variants are kind of transmitting faster than the, the guidelines are changing. And the independent panel actually uh, made, made specific emphasis on this whole precautionary approach. Right. So, Ambrose, I wanted to, to see how do you how do you see WHO taking this um, a recommendation forward. What do you see are the opportunity? What what can be done for WHO to be able to do that? And what do you, what challenges do you see for WHO to move forward with that to to make that happen? I think we we'll start off with the, the declaration of a public health emergency of international concern. And I think that's where the, the panel is advising us to take a precautionary approach depending on, on, the, on the cause of the public health emergency of international concern. And, and I also think uh, the panel is also recommending both actually the HR review committee and the panel are really recommended uh, the independence of, of, the, of the HR review committees. But when they make those recommendations or declare a public health emergency of international concern, measures are put in place in immediately. And and and, and as, I, as I said earlier, we've seen countries that uh, I mean the temporary recommendations are voluntary, but we've seen some countries implementing them, but we, we've seen others not do so. So we might have to have a mechanism where we ensure that the temporary recommendations uh, are, re are reinforced. Now on the whole notion of how we take on the whole the whole va variance of concern, I think it's linked to what my colleague was saying. I think with this, the, the center of intelligence as a hub being set up, I think at the regional level, where this is in Berlin, I think that what this can be, what this can do is really link up to networks of, of, of information centers. So it could be genomic surveillance centers that are being created. And so these are linking up and feeding into this intelligence center. And so WHO has a role working with all the other stakeholders uh, uh, in, 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 in this space, including um, um, it, uh, the academia and, and, and research institutions. But having said that, again, for us to de detect outbreaks early, we need we need attitude peripheral health workers who can diagnose these events very, very quickly. So that is also linked to the second recommendation of having these capacities everywhere. And I think the issue is now, and I recall that the revision of the 1995, uh, the, the 2005, um, HR uh, international health regulation was actually first noted at the World Health Assembly in 1995. And it was not until we had SARS in 2003 that it was revised and then it came into force in 2007. And then no capacities were established. And then they have been extended every time countries say we have not yet fully met the capacities and we extend. I think what the, the, the panel is saying this time, and I look at the, she has even set timelines, and I think this for me is really very, very welcome because prior to, to, to Ebola in West Africa, a post Ebola in West Africa, we had the, the National Academy of Sciences that came up with a, a very nice report as well 
the Commission on Global Health Risks Framework for the Future. I made some of these recommendations, but there was no timeline. And I think for me, what is really good this time, and I hope that the actors who have been put in this report will be taken to account if these things are not in place. I wanted to, um, you know, ask Gabrielle, because she talked about the, uh, you know, financing facility earlier. And, you know, our, our Chandrika and Ambrose were talking about, you know, capacities for genomic sequencing. And there's huge talk, uh, discussions about, uh, you know, vaccine production capacity. Um, Gabriel, th this financing facility, and we're talking about, you know, billions of dollars here, mobilizing billions of dollars every year. How do you think? How do you think this should be used and can you know be made effective to make sure it's actually going to where we need to invest to be able to you know prepare for the next pandemic? Yeah, great question. I want to um, follow up on Dr. Ambrose's comment first, as I was part of a number of the Ebola reports, including the National Academy of Medicine one, and it was very frustrating to see. Um, all of the reports get written and produced and many panels and discussions, and then very little change happens. Um, it's referred to as a cycle of panic and neglect. And so we need to break that cycle this time and ensure that the recommendations of the panel are taken forward. And that was actually a large part of why Pandemic Action Network was created to ensure that there was political advocacy in between pandemics. Um, so, so getting back to the panel's report, um, the recommendations on financing are incredibly important, but we think they're actually quite low compared to what's needed. And you only have to look at what the world has spent on response to COVID pandemic and the devastation to so many small and large businesses across the world to see that investment in preparedness will pay off. And so I don't have the specific answer at the moment on what the first investment should be, but I do think, first of all, we have to end this pandemic uh, as um, we see Chandrika and I were talking prior to the panel, the situation in India has been devastating and it continues to be devastating in rural India and many other Southeast Asian um, countries. And so we have a ton to do to uh, end this pandemic. And what we truly need is a global vaccine plan that is globally coordinated, that we're looking at the full set of supplies, that we're vaccinating vulnerable populations, not just in a completely equitable manner, but looking at how we reach healthcare workers, which countries are most at risk, and then we're getting the vaccines to them. Right now, we're relying on um, too much goodwill and there's not a coordinated plan. We have very few minutes. Could I say something about But uh, yes, please, Ambrose, if you can quickly. Yes, I, I, I think the, the, this financing facility for me, probably this is one of the recommendations that um, well, I think it is, is, is necessary, but I also recall in 2006, the World Bank set up a pandemic emergency financing facility. Right. as both an insurance, an insurance model and a cash model, and countries have actually had challenges accessing, accessing funding, especially for preparedness using the World Bank's pandemic emergency financing facility. So I think this is a recommendation that we might need to go back to, to, the, to, to the drawing board and say, what has what have been the failures or the successes of the World Bank pandemic emergency facility? And how can this leverage and be improved? And I look at the panelists. Uh, we shouldn't create a new institution. Maybe this should leverage on the global fund to fight aid, malaria, and, 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 and TB uh, because they are already funding platform and, and with the lean sector that which is linked and that move forward because that's the, the issue that we already have a facility that has had some setbacks in accessing money mm -hmm. going back to the drawing board that's a good one um chandrika um perhaps you can help wrap up um what how do you think um this this facility can be most effective on the ground especially given you know the situation you're seeing in india yeah, I also want to respond to what Gabriel said um, in terms of the global um, vaccination plan, and I completely agree with that. But I do think um, if there is one lesson we have from the pandemic is that the absolute worst time to make these plans is when you're in the middle of the pandemic. 
right that's when all of the vaccine nationalism all of the all of the imp immediate day to day imperatives and crises of the pandemic put pressures on governments so the time to do this is actually before or after not during um, and i think that's the big lesson in even in terms of the financing facility how do we make sure uh, that the funds and going back to dr Am ambrose's uh, sort of concerns around how previous efforts have not worked out. I do think there needs to be a, a mechanism which is not dependent on the state of pandemic. And that's one point. And the second point is uh, we cannot have a facility that focuses on pandemic preparation when in most low and middle income countries, the healthcare system itself is so weak. So you have to think about pandemic prepared preparedness in the context of financing the health system. And maybe that is a more sustainable way to build resilience in the system so that when shocks of this kind hit, uh, there is greater ability to withstand and cope with it. Not enough, uh, but at least more than what we've seen so far. Well, we don't have much time, but thank you so much to our panelists for all of your great insights, you know, talking about the global vaccine action plan, having to look into what lessons from the past on pandemic facility and having to when should we be starting to look into some of these things. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and please stay tuned um, for our other um, events today. Continuing this conversation on pandemic preparedness, we're now going to narrow in on the role of data and AI in strengthening health systems. I'm Catherine Cheney, I'm a senior reporter at DevEx, and I'm thrilled to be joined by Anne Eretz, who's head of the Novartis Foundation. And I know one of your big messages right now is that COVID really makes it clear we need to transform our health systems from being reactive to proactive, predictive, and eventually preventative. And also that low and middle income countries, which has been a focus of yours throughout your career, have the most to gain as well as the most to lose when it comes to AI. So we'll explore some of these themes in a conversation on the role of data in health systems, strengthening for pandemic preparedness. So Anne, my first question for you is why this is such a turning point. You know, you've said that while COVID-19 has had a devastating human health impact, it can be a turning point when it comes to how we use data and AI in health. So how is that already happening? Yeah, it's really true that it's already happening because I feel COVID um, has been really the, the first epidemic ever that has been so data driven. In fact, we use data throughout the way we try to control it and hopefully we'll soon recover from it as well. We use it, for example, for contact tracing, but also for making real public health decisions that uh, can have the impact on the largest number of people. So data is an essential part of the response to COVID and that's how I see that it can, can really change the way we look at our health systems as well. It's been used massively also to diagnose COVID and one example is um, an AI driven diagnostic with lung images based on x-rays and CT scans that we developed together with our partners in Sao Paulo in the, the University Hospital of Sao Paulo, which is the largest hospital in Latin America with really a huge data lake of patients. And we developed a locally uh, tailor-made diagnostic based on uh, AI for uh, long COVID patients. And that has been tremendously useful for the diagnosis or making it faster and more accurate for tens and tens of thousands of patients across different hospitals in Brazil. But in fact, the, the worst thing now is that we face a syndemic. We, we are seeing these conversions of COVID together with the pre-existing epidemic of non-communicable or chronic diseases, such as heart disease, uh, diabetes, or cancers. And the, we see that COVID patients were even, um, or patients with such chronic diseases, sorry, were even worse off with COVID than other patients. So that conversions of these two diseases and then the interaction of that conversions with the socioeconomic living conditions of people that were um, made much more visible during the COVID pandemic and all these inequities that were pre-existing became really flagrant during the pandemic. And this is an even more urgent alarm bell for um, addressing the, the fact that our health systems are insufficiently ready to 
to uh, look at such a, a complex syndemic. And we need to transform or re-engineer our health system from being that reactive care system, waiting for people to get sick and come and address them when they have a disease, to become proactive, predictive, and even preventative, so that they, they become real health systems that keep people healthy. Absolutely. Well, you mentioned the syndemic and cardiovascular health being a key example of, you know, something where we've seen a really devastating secondary effect, knock on effect yeah. from the COVID-19 pandemic, and yet also an opportunity. So can you zoom in on cardiovascular health in particular and talk about how data and AI can help us reimagine that space moving forward? Yeah, I, I will take the example of uh, our, the approach we have taken in urban cardiovascular population health across the world in cities in Latin America, Africa and Asia. Um, we took an approach which is very comprehensive and is called cardio and every letter in the word cardio stands for something. So the C is quality of care, the A is early access to diagnosis and treatment. The R is reform, policy reforms with proven impact on health. And the D stands for data and digital. While the I is intersectoral collaboration, also something that is absolutely necessary, not only between the health and the tech sector, but also between agriculture, education, um, transport sectors, because these have a bigger impact on the health of populations very often than the health sector alone. And the O of cardio, the last letter is the most important one that every undertaking or initiative on population health has to be owned by the local authorities and driven by them. So that's an example. Um, we have applied that in Sao Paulo again, or in Dakar, the capital city of Senegal. And we've shown that with that comprehensive approach where every pillar is underpinned by the power of data and digital, um, where you can see that you can double the number of people under treatment, and we tripled the blood pressure control rates in a very short time of implementation. One year of implementation, and you uh, triple that control rate, that translates in a lot of people's lives saved. In fact, it translates in about 13 to 15 percent less strokes in the population in one year time. So it's very, very efficient. And the, the success is thanks to the power of data, because without that data, we wouldn't have been able to really uh, set the proper targets together with the authorities. We wouldn't have been able to, to monitor progress of the different interventions or readjust the interventions as they were necessary according to the real-time data. And it really creates a mindset shift in the, in the way that health systems are managed or are um, reoriented. So that's really a, a beautiful example of how the power of data and then the use of the analytics on those data can help policymakers um, get better results. Now, I want to zoom in on, um, you, you mentioned that acronym and what each letter stands for, and the I being intersectoral. And so speaking of that, I want to zoom in on one of the partnerships that the Novartis Foundation is behind, um, which I, I see that you've partnered with Microsoft on the Global Data Collaborative for Cardiovascular Population Health, AI for Better Hearts. So can you just tell us a little bit more about that partnership in particular, you know, what are its goals, what challenges may lie ahead, um, and how it fits into the larger context of that I, intersectoral, and how the Novartis Foundation seeks partners in this space. Yeah, this is a really exciting new partnership. We have launched uh, the Global Data Collaborative for Cardiovascular Population Health with Microsoft and uh, attracting many other partners as well now. The, the goal or the aspiration of that uh, partnership is really to access and analyze as many data as possible with big data analytics to develop these AI-driven insights for policymakers and providers or patients themselves to make better decisions for their own health. So if you can help policymakers identify which groups in the populations are at highest risk for uh, acute events, for example, or which kind of um, groups are really suffering from a lack of access in that or this domain, that's really helpful for policymakers. So that's the goal of the data collaborative. And it's different from existing data collaboratives on cardiovascular disease, because they, the existing ones, they mainly look at 
how you bring innovations or um, game-changing therapies from the bench to the bedside, as they call it, from the R&D to the bed of the patient. And we look at the next phase from how you go from the bedside to the population level side. And that is pretty unique. So we are convinced that this is a real unmet need in the world because policymakers, unfortunately, still have to use a lot of their personal opinions in making decisions about population health interventions. And if you look at the, the example I gave before in the cardio model, where when you give the real-time data in the hands of the decision makers, the results shift drastically in a very short time. So that's why we believe um, in the power of this data collaborative, and it will be an open source uh, repository of cardiovascular data. We will leave the data in situ where they are in a country, for example, because that's one of the challenges to get data out of a country and uh, getting them all together in one single place. That's not really the goal of the data collaborative. It's really to use the power of machine learning to do federated learning, as we say, with analytics in situ on the data that is available. So that will provide insights. But on the other hand, it has, as you said rightly, so I have very many challenges. So uh, very often we see that data sits in these isolated silos, not um, talking to each other, not interoperable between a hospital system or a primary healthcare system or data are not usable because in, when they were collected, the patients were not asked to use that data for other reasons than the one they were collected for. So that's a very um, frequent problem as well. And lastly, um, you need to have the trust of the people to give their data. And that means you need very strong privacy and security measures in the data collaborative to be able to provide that trust um, for the people who will use it and for the people who, who provide their data. Well, you mentioned this lack of interoperability as a real challenge. And I wonder, any other challenges you want to share in terms of public and private sector players looking to share data? You know, tough decisions that have to be made, trade-offs that have to be considered, and, and strategies that are emerging to overcome those challenges? Yeah, there's a lot of trade-offs to be considered, and the, the main strategies for, for overcoming the privacy issue is really to use the uh, top, top tools that a company like Microsoft can bring to, to anonymize data, I would say, to, make, to use differential privacy, for example, something that is really very solid that no one can recognize on the, the patient data, but also the fact that the public sector owns data is um, it's not so easy to that to make that available then to do the analytics on it with data scientists sitting in a private sector organization so you have to have that good good relationship up front if you want to build that and lastly i also think that um, given that there's so many uh, different solutions out there and specifically in the field of digital technology um, it's very important that the government keeps the coordination amongst the partners in their hands or the local authorities, at least it can be the city authority or anyone, but um, that they have the coordination. Otherwise, we end up with a similarly fragmented landscape as what we saw in the digital space before. And with AI, we cannot allow that. Exactly. Learn from mistakes as well as what worked um, and, yes. and avoid that fragmented landscape. So any final thoughts or calls to action for this highly engaged group? How do we make sure that this potential turning point actually is a turning point and a real game changer? Oh, I think the, the real call to global action for that, to make it a game changer and to, to uh, make sure that we get to our real health systems in the world is that um, everyone who plays in the field of health and care has to accept to adopt a data-driven mindset because that's what's going to make the difference. If we do that, you can have tremendously better results if you understand what is going on under your hands instead of waiting on reports that come two years later. You need to use the real-time data. So that mindset shift is quite a shift in many countries, for example. But that is going to be the biggest call to action I would love to do uh, through this channel. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you so much, Anne. And I know you said that 
you know, there's there, it's important to have a data-driven mindset, also a data-driven strategy, because the way to avoid this fragmented landscape of solutions, like we saw in the digital revolution, is to have yeah. a strategy. I know that's something you've shared before. And um, so it's, it's really helpful to learn about your strategy and uh, looking forward to following that moving forward. And now we're going to transition to a session where you all will hear more about the role of essential diagnostics in strengthening primary care. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Bye-bye, Katrin. Well, welcome back to our coverage of the World Health Assembly. I'm Raj Kumar, the President and Editor-in-Chief at DevEx, and I'm joined by Lena Valhet, who is the Director for Alliances at HemoQ. And we're here to talk diagnostics, which is a topic that I think has become very appreciated by people during this pandemic, right? Testing is something we've all kind of understood now in a very personal way. But of course, this has been a long-term challenge, and particularly when you think about non-communicable diseases like diabetes, and this is a space where you and your colleagues at HemoQ are, are real leaders. So we want to get a few minutes with you today, Lana, just to, to get your sense of where we are, given the pandemic, when it comes to diagnostics. What are, what are some of the big themes that you're thinking about? Yes, thank you. Um, it is something that we have very close to our heart. Uh, essential diagnostics is very much where, where hemocure comes from. We, we only produce diagnostics that are needed at a point of care and can make a difference in the dialogue with the patient and the uh, healthcare staff, so to say. Uh, and I, I do believe that NGOs and funders and Minister for Health, they, they do understand the importance of diagnostics, but it can, the the actual uh, availability, of course, can be improved. And, and why is that? And, and why do we have anemia, which is part of malaria and malnutrition, but also diabetes and the non-communicable diseases close to our heart? Uh, and I actually used to, to use uh, a symbol. I don't know if you can see it, if I put it like this. Yeah, I think so. Uh, so this is actually a piece of Swedish crystal, but I think it's neat because it shows you a person it shows you two children. One of these have diabetes, one have anemia, and one have hypertension. How would you know unless you have diagnostics available for them to, for the physician to see who am I to treat with what and for how long? So I think it's kind of neat because this is actually what physicians are facing if they don't have diagnostics available to them. And what do you think is the, you know, there's a lot of conversation at this year's World Health Assembly, of course, about universal health coverage. Mm -hmm. The idea of the, the health system, how resilient and strong it is, is has come into the focus given the pandemic. Um, where do you think diagnostics fit in there? What are maybe people miss about the role of diagnostics from your perspective? Well, I think it needs to be seen um, in, a, in a big way. So if we look at what does the WHO do, um, they have promoted the Diabetes Compact because diabetes have such immense importance for any country, but also for the middle income countries. And that's they big have, news for those who aren't following this, right? This was just last month, this big global compact on diabetes that came out of the WHO. Yes, it, it was uh, at the um, April 14th when uh, it was the um, celebration of the 100 years anniversary of insulin. So that's when it was launched. Uh, and and it, it just to be sure about that, it's actually intended to raise the awareness of importance of diabetes, its prevention, detection, and, and monitoring and treatment. And it was in a way to also highlight the importance of adequate funding also for this important topic, which might not already be there today, unfortunately. So that was one of the reasons. And I think the other reason was to to have all these stakeholders come together and work together, because if you if you have treatment available, but you don't have a diagnosis, you don't know who to treat, that really doesn't make any sense. And if you have the diagnostics, but you do not have the treatment, it doesn't make any sense. So I think that also, um, in a way, was a, a, an opportunity for different stakeholders to come together with the local diabetes associations that had the knowledge that has the outreach and can also train and educate. So I think it was an opportunity to come together and discuss this in a collaborative way. And you're thinking at a higher level about diagnostics. Obviously, you do a lot of work in diabetes, and, and this compact has just come out, which is an important thing. Mm -hmm. But you were, you were getting into how at the universal health systems level, where diagnostics kind of fits in. Mm -hmm. how, how is the debate about it happening? And what, what do you want to see changed in the conversations happening here at the World Health Assembly? 
I think that what we've seen in the past, there has been a lot of funding that has gone into different programs, so malaria, mother and child, um, tuberculosis, HIV, and whereas that is important that that remains, uh, I think what is important also to, and these are the vertical programs, mm -hmm. to also see horizontal funding and in, in this sense of, and I think that can also prove to be a cost efficient solution because the same kind of test being used for within HIV and malaria, which anemia is part of, hemoglobin is part of, it is also part of diabetes because many patients get anemia either because of the diabetes itself, they don't eat properly, or as a consequence of the diabetes and they get the renal um, complications, so to say. So, so I think it's important that we have the vertical programs, but also that we look at them from a horizontal perspective. Yeah, and in fact, there are examples during this pandemic of COVID-19 where the same testing facility used for HIV was repurposed to do testing for COVID-19. And so that infrastructure can be reused, but I guess you're saying the way we think about funding it may be restrictive in a sense. If you're just thinking about it in a vertical approach, instead of focusing on kind of a national diagnostics plan for a country at the country level. Is that mm -hmm. how you'd like to see the global health architecture thinking about this issue? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And what about NCDs in particular? I mean, we're got a little bit into diabetes, but let's go further on that because diabetes is growing. The burden of disease is growing. Mm -hmm. NCDs get maybe less funding and attention historically, at least in, in low and middle income countries than infectious diseases. How, how are you thinking about this issue? And what, what messages do you have for the World Health Assembly on it? Well, I think it's it's important to understand the context of these these countries as well. So, what is that the most important for them to to act on right here and now? But I also think so that is the short term. But they also need to look long term. So, what is the what is the progress that we would like to see? And I think it's health is so important to us, and it's important for for the countries and for the countries to grow both financially, but also in many other instances. So I think uh, I think health is important, and and that's how I would like to frame it. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And I'm just thinking about, you know, you focus on point of care diagnostics, mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's always important in these high level, especially global convenings like WHA, to think about the voice of patients. Mm -hmm. And I wonder wh where do you think patients fit into this? What do they want to see um, when you talk to patients? when it comes to diagnostics and, and broader, how, how diagnostics fit into the health system? Mm. I, I, I used to work with renal associations and I worked with um, uh, actually a dentist who yeah, the, then uh, got chronic kidney disease. Uh, and he was very mindful when he talked about, and he said, what can be prevented needs to be prevented. What can be cured needs to be cured. And what can be treated needs to be treated. And uh, so the earlier we start, the better off it is. But we so, so that was what his his messaging um, was. Uh, and point of care testing that allows testing to be done where the patient is. Those who live in rural communities that is far from the hospital, far from the laboratory, having smaller instruments that provides the same accuracy as the laboratory test does, but doing that close to where the patient is that can really make an impact, I believe. That's my firm belief. Yeah, and there's a lot of technological advancement happening. I mean, even we've seen it during this pandemic that should allow mm -hmm. that to be more possible, right? Yes, for sure. And, and I think it's what is important as well when we speak about innovation, and, and that's also something that is close to my heart. We shouldn't, uh, the, the innovation that lasts is the best innovation. And, and those that are intended and aimed for the destination where they are to be used by the people that is aimed to use it for the patient, for the patients. Uh, so that is what I think is a very, very important parameter and, and topic in this discussion. Uh, it needs to be aimed for the purpose. Right. And that's something we've certainly learned through, you know, the many fads that happen in the, in the global health sector that in the end, it comes down to what do patients want and what serves mm. them, and what, what can actually move the needle on, on these yeah. massive challenges. Well, I thank you, Lena Valhead, for bringing us this issue of diagnostics to the conversation around the World Health Assembly. It's an important one. Is there any final thought you wanted to you wanted to give? Um, I would like to take back my crystal figure, <laughs> <laughs> and and without the diagnostics, the physician has not the tools that he needs. Uh, and I think we owe our fellow citizens, fellow members of our communities to be tested and to be treated because 
health and universal health is actually something I think we should be able to take for granted, but we cannot do that today. So that is my, um, and, and there are tools available today. Yeah, if there's anything this pandemic has underlined, it's how unequal the health systems are and how different the outcomes can be. Mm. Um, we thank you and we thank uh, everyone who's following along our coverage here of World Health Assembly. Thanks for being a part of this. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Rumbi. I'm an associate editor here at DevEx. And today I'm joined for, by two people for a very interesting conversation. We have uh, Professor Helen Fletcher, a professor of immunology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, as well as Dr. Jerome Kim, Director General for the International Vaccine Institute. Um, thank you so much for joining me. Pleasure. Thank you. Okay, so today we're here to talk about mRNA technology, that's messenger RNA technology, and this technology has been described as a game changer. So why, why does it have so much potential and can you tell us a little bit more about it? I think I'll start with you, Helen. Um, yeah, sure, thank you. Um, well, I work in vaccine development and I teach vaccine immunology and um, I always start my lectures by saying that vaccines are our most effective and cost effective public health tool. And if you look at the history of vaccine development, um, you know, it started back in the 18th century with um, whole live organisms. Um, and then we attenuated or heat killed those organisms. And then uh, we used uh, sort of subunits um, and then conjugate technologies um, and so on. And what we see is that each time there is a new platform technology, we see a wave of vaccine development. And the exciting thing about the mRNA technology is that it's a new platform technology for vaccines. And so I expect that we will see a wave of vaccine development for a range of pathogens in the way that we have done when we've introduced um, new vaccine technologies in uh, previous years. So we started talking a lot about mRNA technology around the COVID vaccine and the development of COVID vaccines for that. Why, were, why weren't we not speaking about this technology before or were there conversations around it and people were just not aware? I'll pass this on to you, Jerome. Thank you. RNA technology has been around uh, for a bit over two decades. In fact, when I was still doing work in HIV vaccines in the early 2000s, we were working with companies that eventually became part of GSK uh, that were working on different types of RNA vaccines. There had been a couple of publications on the testing of RNA vaccines in humans, one from CureVac, which is one of the RNA companies involved in COVID vaccine development, and another one from Moderna. And the induced uh, levels of protection, the immune responses to those vaccines were not as strong as we would have hoped. Um, but like many technologies that are emerging, the first swing uh, isn't necessarily always a home run. That's, I guess, an American baseball term, but it isn't always a, a smashing success. And, and the same is true of mRNA technology. And so, frankly, when, when I saw that you know, CEPI was going to pay for uh, two different kinds of RNA technology. I thought, oh, not again. Um, is this what we really want? But they have made significant changes in the RNA technology, particularly in the mode of presentation. The use of these lipid nanoparticles has, um, and, and potentially new manufacturing techniques have improved the ability to manufacture and, and develop mRNA vaccines that actually have the kinds of immune responses that are important and, and, and very importantly protective. Okay, so we've seen um, this working in the COVID space, and I think that was a little bit of a home run there in the COVID space. But in terms of other diseases, and what are the challenges and opportunities for adapting this technology to other diseases? And I know both of you can speak to this. So maybe we can start with you, Helen. I know you've been doing a lot of work in the TB space. And then Jerome, maybe you can add on to that as well. Um, yeah, so uh, until COVID-19, tuberculosis was the uh, single uh, largest killer due to infectious disease globally, and around 2 million people a year die of uh, tuberculosis, and actually up to a third of the world's population 
are infected with TB. Um, and but we don't hear about this. Um, we don't, you know, we don't see TB being a priority pathogen in the way that COVID-19 is. And of course, it's, it's because tuberculosis largely affects people living in low and middle income countries. And also it's a very slowly progressing disease. And so people live with tuberculosis for years before they die and they people just slowly fade away. Um, and they get stigmatized and so they'll perhaps be you know excluded from society from their families people are afraid of infection and so we've seen this silent pandemic of tuberculosis which has been with us for many centuries um, and it's absolutely right that we should be turning our attention now to diseases such as TB to see what have we learned from COVID-19 that we can apply to tuberculosis so that we can um, control and you know, potentially even eliminate this pathogen, which has a devastating effect on so many people globally. And the mRNA technology, you know, does this, is this new platform, is this new technology a way that we could really stimulate TB vaccine development? I mean, we've had a TB vaccine since um, the 1920s. In fact, 2021 is the 100th year anniversary since BCG was first used in a, a human clinical trial. So we have this vaccine and uh, BCG is partially protective. We see that it has about 50% efficacy against uh, the most severe childhood forms of tuberculosis, but it isn't effective against adult pulmonary disease. And so we still see transmission of TB in communities for this reason. So we need better vaccines for TB, and this has been understood for many years. But despite 20 years of vaccine development for TB, the pipeline is very empty and the pipeline is very slowly moving. So we have about 25 vaccine candidates in the TB vaccine pipeline, compared to about 250 in the COVID-19 vaccine pipeline, despite the fact that you know, we've been developing vaccines for TB for 100 years. We're, we're so behind and so slow in the way that we react. So I really do hope that this mRNA technology will bring us uh, and stimulate um, the, the TB vaccine pipeline and bring us some new candidates that we might work with. But the problem is that, you know, tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis is a bacterial pathogen. It's not a virus. So it's much more complex in its structure. And it has ways in which that it evades the immune response. So for example, it evades an antibody response by actually hiding within a human cell and replicating within a human cell. And so these neutralizing antibodies, which the mRNA vaccines are incredibly good at inducing, may not be enough to control uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. So I am really excited about the potential of the mRNA vaccine platforms, but it's not going to be easy for TB. Um, we're not going to be able to take exactly the same platform that we've used for COVID-19 and apply it to mycobacterium tuberculosis. It's very likely that we're going to have to modify the mRNA vaccines in some way. So we're going to have to um, modulate them so that we induce more of a T cellular immune response in addition to an antibody response. It may be that we have to deliver them directly to the lung so that we can get them to the site of uh, M tuberculosis primary infection um, rather than delivering them systemically. So there are challenges ahead, um, but there's also opportunities. And, and I think we, we absolutely should be um, driving forward now, looking at tuberculosis and other pathogens of global importance as well to see where we could apply this new platform technology. Uh, thanks so much. And Jerome, just to bring you into the conversation, do we see the same opportunities in the HIV space? Yes, and so I think that, that Helen makes a great point. Um, the RNAs that were tested in COVID, um, in, in a sense, had an easy proof of concept. This is a virus where an inactivated viruses work, where 
adenovirus vectors of various types that express COVID um, surface uh, spike protein appear to work. Um, the mRNA vaccines appear to work. The Novavax protein appears to work. So this was a good target. The targets that we're interested in, tuberculosis, HIV, and I would throw out malaria and, and diseases like schistosomiasis as well, where vaccine development has been more difficult because the pathogen hides or changes itself um, or as a part of its life cycle expresses different uh, important components to the immune system um, may present more of a problem, but the RNA vaccines offer a new way to approach them. So for instance, with HIV, you know, we've tried proteins, we've tried viral vectors of different kinds, including adenovirus vectors. Um, and really we've had one modest success, but a lot of failures. One of the things we've learned over the last 10 years is that a particular set of immune genes that form the infection fighting proteins appear to be critical for the generation of what we call broadly neutralizing antibodies. The problem is that they may need to be tickled in sequence and perhaps the use of, of RNA vectors allows us a certain amount of flexibility in being able to target those evolving sectors of the, of the binding parts of the antibody to generate broadly neutralizing antibody. Now it's just a, a concept but it's something that the RNA technologies bring forward. I think the other important thing that um, Helen brought out uh, is that you know, we have a lot of vaccines that work currently, a lot of bacterial vaccines that are very important for childhood diseases. Uh, things that are binding to um, special sugars that coat the outside of bacteria. Those might be more difficult to develop RNA vaccines against. So it may not be that we're reinventing all vaccines. I mean, certain vaccines perhaps, uh, vaccines with too much toxicity or uh, vaccines for difficult targets like HIV, TB, malaria. Um, but some of the other vaccines are probably going to stay as they are. And, and the other part is these are vaccines that we know we can mass produce at very low cost uh, and distribute around the world with um, very easy logistics. Those aren't things that necessarily the, the TB vaccines have achieved yet. I mean, maybe in time. Um, but but there are gonna be other vaccines out there that we probably won't replace right away. So one of the questions I was going to ask both of you was, uh, with the COVID-19 vaccine, we saw these vaccines being developed at record speed. And are we going to see the same speed applied to the development of vaccines, maybe in the TB space or the HIV space? But what I'm hearing is that it's not that simple. Am I correct, Helen? Yeah, that's right. It's not it's not that simple. We're, we're not uh, going to be able to take these technologies um, for the, all, all the reasons that we, we discussed. You know, these are, are complex pathogens that are remaining, um, which, which need broad types of immune responses. Um, and, and the mRNA vaccines may well have a role and it might be an important role, um, but perhaps, a, a, you know, a sort of multi vaccine uh, platform, um, you know, one one vaccine matched with another type of vaccine, for example. Um, but it's, it's not going to be as simple as just taking it and using it. And of course, um, as well with, with tuberculosis, um, we have the BCG vaccine. And at the moment, that vaccine is um, sold at 10 cents a dose for global use. It's one of the mo most widely used vaccines globally only at 10 cents a dose. So even if the mRNA uh, technologies come down in cost, they are so far away to being accessible for people living in low and middle income countries. Um, so there's a long way to go. And, and absolutely, in, in, including the cold chain as well, if you look at the challenges with distribution, um, you know, a vaccine, even a vaccine which is stored at minus 20 degrees rather than minus 70 degrees, the complexity of delivering that kind of vaccine into, you know, rural clinics, for example, where women are giving birth and where you maybe want to immunizing infants is, is huge. Um, so there are, um, you know, remaining challenges absolutely with using and deploying these new vaccine technologies. So when you speak about accessibility and sharing this technology, what role is the mRNA technology hub going to play in all of this? Um, Jerome, I'll pass this question on to you. I think the important question is which mRNA technology hub? I think countries around the world have been
very actively pursuing uh, mRNA as a as a potential technology. But you know, one of the things is that we and and I'm sure Professor Fletcher has done this too. I mean, our labs prepare our. Uh, it's been it's difficult. It's um, it, you have to be absolutely certain about the preparation. It isn't the RNA itself, but the process that goes into manufacturing these RNA technologies that make them uh, not as easy to copy. And and I read an article, so I don't know if this is necessarily true, uh, that the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine uh, requires fifty thousand steps. So it isn't the RNA; it's the process of making these. That is going to be really critical in order to generate the the vac kinds of vaccines that we want for some of the other diseases uh, that we're interested in. So I hope that the mRNA technologies mature. I hope that the lipid nanoparticle or the other mechanisms to deliver these uh, RNA molecules um, continues to improve, so that we don't see you know, very high levels of, of fever as a side effect, or that people don't feel like they've uh, they've got the flu when they get the second dose of the vaccine. I mean, these are all incremental improvements that I think we can make. Um, I think it's important that countries around the world, um, universities and, and research centers, um, continue to advance RNA technology. And you know, we have to be really thankful for the governments around the world that funded this research initially, um, because without it, the companies wouldn't have the technological base in which they built these um, these very effective vaccines for COVID. So, I think yes, it's going to be important. Uh, it's important that that this technology be disseminated and it's important that we make improvements in it so that they become more accessible. Okay, so um, we're coming to the end of our conversation. So just uh, as a final thought, I'll ask both of you this. So what will it take for us to actually fast track the use of this technology and to make sure that it's accessible? A double question there for you guys. I'll start with you, Helen. Um, I mean, I think that the uh, WHO initiative having the technology transfer hubs um, uh, is, is, a, is a great start. And so you're looking at uh, increasing manufacturing capacity for mRNA vaccines globally. Um, if, you, if you look below the surface of that, um, then they are looking for hubs which already have the ability, existing ability, to manufacture on large scale. They are looking for products and vaccines which are already proven in clinical trials to be able to transfer to those hubs. And, and that is great, and it, it's a great start. Um, and uh, But there are so few, there are going to be so few facilities which fulfill those criteria, so few facilities in low and middle income countries which already have that capacity for large scale manufacturing, although there are some. Um, and then you're going to, and then you're waiting for those products and those vaccines to come along and for the intellectual property to be made available so that um, that manufacturing can happen. But, you know, I mean, what we really need is, first of all, sustainability. So we need to be building those manufacturing sites, building that capacity in a sustainable way so that it's not just, you know, swooping in and, uh, you know, using facilities for manufacturing and then moving on when it's not needed. You need those facilities to exist and to grow um, and for the capacity strengthening um, to, to, to be broadly distributed um, in, in many countries, um, not just single centres in each region. But you need investment for that. So you need money to support manufacturing. And beyond that, I think it's also really important to invest in research uh, directly in low and middle income countries as well, because these manufacturing plants can't be passively waiting for people in wealthier countries to come up with some intellectual property or some research idea for a vaccine. It should be countries themselves who are driving the research agendas, making sure that the uh, research programs and the manufacturing is focused on pathogens of relevance to their own country and their own region and their own scientists who are um, you know, actually building uh these these vaccines and and testing them and owning the intellectual property 
so that that can feed into these manufacturing plants um, as well. And I think, I think, you know, it's a really great start to have distribution of vaccine technologies and manufacturing capacity, but it needs to be matched by the distribution of research and the academic strength as well. And I think when those two things come together, and if they're invested in appropriately, then we'll see a real renaissance in vaccine development and vaccines of relevance for global health. Uh, thank you so much, Helen. And we're just left with one minute, unfortunately. So Jerome, any final thoughts on this? So I agree completely with that, uh, Professor Fletcher. But if you go to the Duke Global Health Innovation website, there's actually by manufacturer a list of where the, the vaccines are being made or fill and finished in the world. And it's actually a very interesting website because when you look at the AstraZeneca vaccine, it is really manufactured and actually filled and finished all over the world. But when you look at the RNA vaccines, the number of sites where those vaccines are made is very restricted, primarily North America and Europe and, and one site in China. And you know, that's going to change and it needs to change. As the technology matures, as countries and companies are, are able to open up. The, the only other thing that I'd add to what Professor Fletcher said is, in the end, someone has to buy the vaccine. So not only do we have to have the model of funding the vaccine development, but in the end, no company is gonna make a vaccine that people won't buy. And so if we have smaller regional manufacturers, someone has to commit to buy that vaccine at a, at a higher price than we would normally get if we went to the Serum Institute or to a you know, mass manufacturer in Korea that can churn out vaccine at, at a relatively low unit cost. So we're going to have to find, as, as Professor Fletcher said, a sustainable model for funding not only vaccine research, but the other end, which is the uptake of those vaccines and their use in global health. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, both of you, for this fascinating conversation. And I know that our journalists will be following this, and um, I know that your institutions will also be following this. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, everyone, for being with us. Um, welcome back. I'm Vince Chadwick in uh, in Brussels, joined by uh, Jenny Re Lee Ravelo, um, our global health reporter. Um, very interesting to hear on that that final panel some of the challenges with the mRNA um, technology and on cost and, and distribution, which is very relevant to some of the discussions we'll be having tomorrow around um, the global vaccination efforts with um, AstraZeneca CEO uh, Pascal Sorio. Um, and he'll be in conversation with uh, our editor-in-chief, Raj Kumar. So, Jenny, I wanted to ask you, um, bearing in mind that you'll be busy covering the discussions at the WHA itself tomorrow, uh, we will also be back um, at, at 3 o'clock uh, Euro European time for another, another um, group of discussions. What should um, people be keeping an eye out for in, in what we've got coming up tomorrow? One thing, you know, that I wasn't able to get to during my panel earlier, there were questions on IP, you know, IP rights. And so I just want to tell our audience that we actually have, um, you know, a COVID-19 IP debate happening tomorrow. Um, so something that they should be uh, tuning in. Um, we do also have a vaccine rollout, um, lessons on vaccine rollout in Africa. Do you want something to look forward to tomorrow? Um, I'll be watching that one closely. It was something that um, came up at, at President Emmanuel Macron's um, uh, summit on uh, financing African economies um, last week. Uh, the idea Europe's making a big push into local manufacturing in Africa, although I'm told by the European Investment Bank that that won't be online this year. Um, certainly the effort is to be better prepared for next time. Um, if you're interested in the idea of building back better and some of the things we've been discussing today, I uh, encourage you to check out our series with Smile Train um, on how we can build back better health systems that are effective, equitable and preventative as well. So there's something we're constantly covering at DevEx. Uh, in the meantime, I just thank our um, partners today, AstraZeneca, Gilead, HemoQ, Novartis Foundation, GSK and uh, Save the Children. Uh, we look forward to having you with us tomorrow and please get in touch with us um, on Twitter or LinkedIn or anywhere else to, um, to let us know what's on your mind, things that um, you'd like us to cover and um, be covering it over, over the week. We're always happy to hear from our audience, but otherwise, thank you very much for joining us today um, and I'll see you all again tomorrow.